Preparation, that sort of thing. We're going to speak uh, uh, specifically about the Haggadah. And what I like to do when I speak about the Haggadah, you know, there, first of all, there's a, a mistake in approach that people have when they go to the, the Pesach Seder. Every time, around year, every time of the year, around, uh, around Pesach time, when uh, you go to the bookstores in, in Geula and in Measharim in Israel, so I see, you know, they got tables full of Haggadahs with all the different Mephorshim and Perushim and everything else. And that's really not what the Seder is meant to be. The Seder is really meant to be the Gadot Labincha. It's Sipur Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. It's telling over the story of Mitzvah Yitzrayim. And the biggest Talmud Chacham, Gedoli Yisrael, when they told it over, they told it over as a story. They just went through the Haggadah. And you make sure that the, the, the Seder is not meant to be with all sorts of a, 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 a intricate, Analysis of the commentaries on the Haggadah. That's not that's not Sipur Yitzchak's time. That's that's a, a, a studying the Haggadah, which is fine to do. And what I usually try to get my family to do is to uh, uh, is to do that when they bring out the food. So then discuss the Haggadah. But the flow of the Seder should be a flow that goes that kind of runs through and it runs through ba- uh, you know very very smoothly, especially when you have small children in the home. And uh, 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 you want you want things to move a little bit. If you got the Hamodia, this week's Hamodia, the one that came out on Thursday, so I have a column in there in the Binyan section where I put the uh, I put the Haggadah in rhyme. And what I do at home is because I always struggled with different age groups. So you got di- not only different age groups, you got different generational groups. It's so always a struggle. How do you keep everybody interested at the seder? So one year I stumbled across the idea of doing the Haggadah in rhyme. I made up a few poems as we went through, and I found that that was the most uh, uh, successful part of the of the Seder. And they didn't listen to anything else that I said. But when I said the poems, all of a sudden everybody paid attention. Even adults were paying attention. You know, as kids for sure, but they, even adults started paying attention, trying to guess the rhyme word. And then what I did was, as I developed it, I tried to get it much more content oriented. So I worked on, I put a lot of work into it to try to introduce each section of the Haggadah with a rhyme that's describing what's happening in that section. Then when we do it, then we say it inside, then we can discuss it a little bit if anybody has anything to say, that sort of thing. You know, i just give you one example. Like it says, Rebbe Lozer ben Azariah had a beard, but something about it was a little weird. There you go, and, and that sort of thing. And then all of a sudden everybody's like, wow, I got that one. <laughs> and all of, a sudden, all of a sudden everybody, you know, everybody, then the kids, aka okay, okay, kid, not now. And now I'm busy with the poems, I'm busy with the rhymes, <laughs> and the kids are forgotten about. But as long as, it, that's the idea, you want to you keep you want to keep uh, uh, keep it flowing. So I want to speak about a few points on the Haggadah, which are not, again, it's not a, a pshat as much as a yesod, a fundamental of what it is that we're meant to be taking out of that particular piece of, of the Haggadah. So first of all, we start with Kadesh, and everybody's in Kadesh, everybody makes their Kiddush, and everybody's in a good mood, until you get your seats at the table, until the kids stop squabbling over who's sitting where, and who got more grape juice, and so on and so forth. Then eventually, eventually you get that organized. And, and then you get to Urchatz. You, know, you wash your hands, and everybody is to be reminded, don't make a bracha. There's always one person in the house who forgets. You know, usually the frum daughter who's just back from Sem forgets, and she makes the bracha. You know, and then and then there's you know, and everybody is uh, what do you call it? The you know, up in arms. Now what do we do? Oh well, she made she made an altia say you can't talk now for the next hour and a half, <laughs> which is the first time she's been quiet. The longest stretch she's ever had of being quiet. Everybody's happy, and then then you get the one wise guy's son. There's always one kid like this who will go over and he'll make a fake bracha. And say he said, say it's Baruch Ata Adonenu, right? And if you do that real fast, it says like sounds like somebody said Hashem like the Baruch Ata Adonenu Melcha Olam. Like everybody, <coughs> what did you do? What you know? Ha ha! Just kidding. <laughs> There's always one, and him and the daughter. You know, he's the one who we should have silenced. But whatever it is, he, so that, 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 that's that's where we that's where we start. Then you get the Karpas, Kadesh uh, 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 Karpas, and the Karpas is the first thing we want to speak about because the Karpas is a very very Intriguing, uh, intriguing little mitzvah. You sit down at the seder, and the is, is this thing have to be here? The, the, this thing is right where it's supposed to be. <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> Hi, iPod. Uh, uh, what do you call it? The the um, um, I'm just not getting along with him. That's the problem. He uh, it's, it's fine. No, he could stay. I don't mind. I just don't want him to fall. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Is that good? Okay. <laughs> The uh, the um, 
hate to have to pay for this equipment. The, uh, you, you get the car pass. Now, what happens is you sit down at the Seder, and you're absolutely starving, which is a mistake, by the way. You shouldn't be. Don't go into the Seder starving. And ladies, first thing you do, pay off money. I heard this from Rebetzin Feldman, of Aaron Feldman's wife, Rosh Hashiva of Baltimore. First thing you do on Erev Pesach, first thing in the morning is put up an enormous pot of food. It's the first thing you do. Because uh, uh, men, males of every age, have a sense exactly when you don't want them to want to eat is when men want to eat, right? That, that's a, and exactly the things you don't want them to eat is when they want to eat. So on Erev Pesach, it's like Thursday night when I come home, it happens, I, I don't know how ladies are able to do this consistently. You know, I come into the house after a late Seder at the Yeshiva, I come tiptoeing in at 11.30 or 12 o'clock at night, my wife is blissfully asleep. And this is the best time, Thursday night, walk into the kitchen, open the refrigerator, there's a fresh kugel, right? And as soon as I start reaching, all of a sudden the voice, don't touch the kugel, it's for the Goldman's Kiddush. One second, I just left her, I know she was asleep. She wasn't asleep, she was in deep sleep, I'm sure she wasn't. Because when I asked her, <laughs> and you open up, don't touch her, how did she know? <laughs> the voice, the voice from the end. So, so men have this sense. Now, you've got to put up the food because kids are hungry all day, men are hungry all day, and you don't want to go into the Pesach Seder starving. It's not a good idea. Go into the Pesach Seder. You'll have, don't worry, you'll be able to eat the matzah le avon, but you should not go in starving because then you won't enjoy the Seder. All you're thinking about is let's get to the food. And if you go in, you're basically okay, and then eventually you'll get to, eventually you'll get, you'll, you'll get there. Now, ironically, you take the karpas, and you take, what's karpas supposed to be? Take a piece of celery, Usually celery could be a potato, whatever they have done, but usually a piece of celery, dip it in salt water, and then you're dipping it, and it's we just wash. It's meant to be an appetizer. Now, if you stop and think about it, it's a very strange appetizer because you take a bite of celery, and you think to yourself, wow, I really am starving. You know, it, it reminds us how hungry, we, how hungry we really are, number one. And number two, you can't eat more than, uh, you, you have to eat less than a kazais. There's always that one for me at the table who says, you less than a less than a kazayas, you know, no, I can't, you know, you take this microscopic piece of, 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 of sully, and that's it, that's the whole story. So it's very strange, why would we be eating an appetizer, then you wait 45 minutes till you get to the meal, question number one. Question number two, the Gemara says that um, the Jewish people were on the 49th level of impurity, and they had to get out of Egypt, that everybody knows. On the other hand, it says they didn't change their names, they didn't change their clothing, and they didn't change their language, which after 210 years is pretty imp impressive. The Jews came to America, I don't know what happened here, but Jews came to America in 1945. Within a generation, they certainly didn't speak Yiddish, and they certainly changed their names. Nobody was called Zalman and Fival anymore, and they certainly changed their clothing. And here, Kla Yisrael, 210 years they were in Egypt, and for 210, after 210 years, they didn't change anything, and yet they are called as they're, they're they're described as being on the 49th level of impurity, which is which is which, which needs to be reconciled. And number three, there's a medrash that says when Moshe Rabbeinu came to redeem, redeem the Jewish people, so he said to the Jewish people, "Pakod pakadati." That was the code word. He said, "Pakod pakadati." It's okay, don't worry, don't worry. I, I like I like them more than I like the adults, right? So that you know they're they're good. You know, if the adults would behave like kids, we'd be okay. The problem is, people adults say to kids, "Stop." You know, you got adults say to each other, "You know, you're behaving like a couple of children." That's not true. That's not true. When children fight, they're behaving like adults. Right? That's the reality. You know, we don't like to admit it because when children fight, they finish within five minutes and they go out and play ball together. When adults fight, they don't talk to each other for twelve years. Right? <laughs> so, so, so it'll, he's fine. The uh, maybe they just take off the coat because it's warm here. The uh, the it, we it, we could open a window. It, maybe just get say it is it is warm. It's behind you. That's why. What's that? The heating behind you. Is it on? It was. It's it should be off. Are, are you uncomfortable? Are you comfortable? Or you're good. Uh huh. <laughs> Okay, me too. The, uh, I guess it's not warm. <laughs> the, the, uh, my imagination. The, uh, the uh, what do you call it? If you, if you, if you're, if you get warm, uh, let me know, or we'll open a window if we, if we have to. Except the, the, what happens? Somebody once said, "No married couple, no married couple is thermally compatible." Right? One is always boiling hot, the other is freezing cold. They're very extreme in this, you know. So, so it's, it, it's a problem. But if, it, in case you get cold, so let me know, and I'll, I'll laugh. The. Uh, <laughs> So we have uh, this, the third question is Moshe Rabbeinu comes, he says to the Jewish people, Pakod Pakadati, he redeems the Jewish people. Then the Medrash says, after redeeming the Jewish but he disappeared for six months. Moshe Rabbeinu, you ever hear that Medrash? He left for six months. What's going on here? So the answer is like this. The answer, one, one of the approaches of the commentaries is like this. You know, if I would ask you, do you believe in Mashiach? What would you say? 
believe in Mashiach? Do you believe in Mashiach? Do you believe in Mashiach? Anybody? Do you believe in Mashiach? Do you believe in Mashiach? Believe? Okay. Mashiach. Yeah, I'm so Mashiach. Yeah. We all believe in Mashiach. Right? Did any of you this morning read the news? Anybody read? Did you read the news in front? Newspaper? You check your phone? Did you read the news? Did you check the news every morning? You didn't. Uh huh. Okay, so like I was saying, when you check the news this morning, right, or <laughs> and, and, on any given morning, the last time you checked the news, did you ever look for the headline? You open up the headline, uh, oh, nothing about Mashiach? Again? Uh, one second, maybe it's on the back page. No, that's a sport. Sorry, that's important. One second, let me read that. Okay, no, nothing about, and you go leafing through, and you didn't find anything, you didn't look anything for Mashiach. You didn't look for, I thought you believed in Mashiach. You believe Mashiach's going to come. So why aren't you looking through the newspaper trying to find Mashiach? Why don't you turn on and get a news report? Maybe he's there. And maybe he's there. If you saw the way the guys checked the news to find out the football stores from Saturday, Saturday night, they have the review of all the game, games, highlights of the week. You know, why does the highlight start? Uh, news, sighting of Mashiach, right? Why, it doesn't start that way. It starts with sightings of, 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 of footballers. You know, and if they score four goals, then that, that's Mashiach. You know, that, that's already. So, so, so you have a situation, you have a situation where we believe, but how much do we really, do you really believe? I understand. Why aren't, we, why aren't we thinking about it? You ever wait for the train? When you wait for the sub subway train, if he's a minute late, you know, you're looking, is he coming? Is he on the way? You're looking at the clock. The answer is that Kla Yisrael, an identity, a Jewish identity, could be a blessing and a curse. Because on the one hand, they had their names, their language, and everything else. Do you know that there's a phenomenon in Israel? Israelis who are born, raised in Israel, leave Israel, and become Bali Tshuva in Kutzlaretz. They go to Chutzlaretz, and they go to West Germany, Los Angeles, Canada, and they become Baal Tshuvas, come back to Israel. Why is that? Why is that? Interesting. Why is that? Nachon? Nachon? Nachon or Nachon? Again, again, Lama. Lama. So, you, could, you, you could say, you know, there are theories. One of the theories is that when you're in Israel, you speak Hebrew, you have a Jewish name, an Israeli name, you may go to Pesach Seder, you may go to Yom Kippur, and so you have something of a Jewish, you say Yalabai, and you have a, something of a Jewish identity. Then you leave Israel and you're West Germany and you're surrounded by non-Jews. And so you're looking around, they all know who they are, who am I? And you start searching. And when you start searching, you then carry your search all the way through to the end. That's, how, that's what they, they suspect. The enthusiasm strikes the person when they lose sense of their Jewish identity, then also they get to become, ironically, they become a little more enthusiastic. Jewish people are Mitzrayim for 210 years. Did they believe they're going to be redeemed from Mitzrayim? They believed it exactly to the extent that we believe in Mashiach coming. Do we believe Mashiach could come any day? Yeah, we believe. We say it all the time. Is it something I'm living? Is it something I think about when I go to sleep at night or get up in the morning? My mortgage broker would tell you no. Right? I'm thinking about other things. And therefore, why aren't I thinking about it? If I really felt that it's on the way, I'd be, I'd be feeling it right now. The answer is, the answer is, that sometimes a person gets flat. A person loses, it's like a drink that loses the fizz. I have a Jewish identity. I've come to terms with who I am. We're stuck in exile. And that's exactly how the Jewish people felt. So on the one hand, you know, I'm a good Jew. But when, on the other hand, I'm in a pretty hopeless situation. What does your overall service look like under those circumstances? What does your, what's your davening look like and your Torah study look like? You know, we just say, I kind of go, what's the point of this? Where, where, what are we doing this for? So what happens? Moshe Rabbeinu shows up. Now imagine the following. Imagine the following. Person is suffering from chronic knee pain. For 20 years, he's had chronic knee pain. One day he goes to the doctor, and the doctor says that, you know, maybe we can leave that door open. Maybe that door will bring in more, uh, more, more air. Uh, uh, he, goes to, he goes to the, what he call? thank you very much. He goes to the doctor, and the doctor says, look, I have a pill that will take away your pain. 24 hours, you'll be free of pain, but, and, and no side effects. No side effects, I want you to try this pill. The guy takes the pill, and thank you very much. And for the first time in 20 years, he has no pain. Comes back to the doctor 24 hours later, says to the doctor, it was great, I'll take a prescription. The doctor says, I'm sorry, the Food and Drug Administration has not okayed this pill. It won't be on the market for another six months. So, question. In the next six months, until the pills are on the market, do you think that the pain will bother him more or less than it has up until that point? Why? He'll think about it. In other words, when a person suffers chronic pain, so then, okay, a person learns to deal with chronic situations in life. You know, you come to terms with it. You figure out how to deal with it. All of a sudden, a person realizes there's relief in sight, and it's a bunch of bureaucratic red tape that's stopping me from getting the relief. So I'm thinking, why do I have to go, go through this suffering right now? Okay, you can make an argument the other way that when a person knows relief is in sight, so it takes some of the edge off. But every day when a person is suffering the pain, they're thinking to themselves, what do I need to go through this for? Comes along, Moshe Rabbeinu, Pekod Pekadati. 
have redeemed you. What do you think the level of belief of the Jewish people was the next morning in a redeemer? Their level, wow, we, hey, we're really getting out of here. Then Moshe Rabbeinu disappears. Then the Jewish people, every time they opened up a newspaper and every time they went to shul, it went, hey, did you see him? Did anybody see Moshe Rabbeinu? Did anybody see him? I noticed somebody looks very much like him. Is that him? No, no, that's his brother Aaron. He's only three almost tall. Moshe Rabbeinu's 10 almost tall. So there's a 14 foot difference, a height difference between them, but they do look facially alike. And you're looking around for Moshe Rabbeinu. Everywhere you go, you're looking and you're talking about it. You're davening with more enthusiasm. Uh, imagine, imagine a person is deathly ill. Chas v'shalom. And the doctor says there's no hope. There's no hope. Within six weeks, this person is going to be gone. You still daven, right? Still daven for the person, okay? Scenario number one. Scenario number two, the doctor, the person is deathly ill. The doctor says to you, there's been an upturn in his situation. His vitals are kicking in. There's improvement here, improvement there. If things continue, then in six weeks, he has a chance of leaving the hospital. Which one of those two patients, when you daven, do you daven with real enthusiasm for? Which one, the first one or the second one? What would you say? Second. Say the second one. Second. The first one, we daven because we know, we, we believe that davening works. But in my heart of heart, I'm thinking to myself, I know I'm going to daven, but is my davening really strong enough to overturn a doctor saying that it's hopeless? Whereas once I'm told there's a ray of hope, we jump on the bandwagon and we're riding it, we're enthusiastic, then we're really davening. Come on, now, now there's something to daven for. So when Moshe Rabbeinu shows up, he brings the Jewish people out of their stupor. He wakes them out of their stupor. They're in a spiritual, spiritually flat. All of a sudden, Moshe Rabbeinu is here. Now all of a sudden, people are a little, they're learning better. They're much less Lush and Hara. And everybody's doing chesed because we understand that this is real. Now we're, it's tangible. They're for the Jewish people. That's Karpas. You know what Karpas is, the commentary say? You sit and eat that Karpas? The Karpa, that's exactly correct. You're laughing? I want to tell you something. There is nothing that we do in Judaism, any minhag that we have, especially the Seder, where it's all instituted by Chazal, we look at it as if it's like, okay, we'll break this, and the wine is really blood, you know, we'll drop, I drink blood, I know it's the best tasting cat and blood I've ever had, you know, and the matzah, ah, then. if there's a custom among the Jewish people, Chazal instituted a custom, there's something much deeper behind it. And the commentaries of Shem Yishmuel says, you eat the karpas as a reminder of how hungry you are. Exactly what's supposed to happen when Moshe Rabbeinu says, Pakot Pakadati, and exactly what's supposed to happen if Mashiach would walk in right now. And then he would disappear. We, we'd be, by tomorrow morning, we'd be different people. A hundred, our behavior would be different because we really believe it. And the food ultimately is a reminder that there will be a redemption coming. So when the food comes out on Pesach night, it's not just some roast chicken. It's not just some chicken and meat. It's actually the eating of the food is actually what we're doing is what's called, you know, uh, anybody here take vitamins? Take vitamins regularly. People take vitamins, right? Do you feel the effect of the vitamin? No. Do you believe there's an effect of the vitamin? Yes. And that's why we take vitamins. We take vitamins because we believe there is an effect. Every mitzvah we do has an effect on our neshama. Man puts on tefillin, a woman benches licht, refraining from me. Every time we do a mitzvah, it has an effect on our neshama. My son went to yeshiva in Eretz Yisrael. I always use him as an example. He was, because he was my most mischievous son. He went to a yeshiva gadol in Eretz Yisrael. There's 600 boys between the ages of 18 and 22. 600 males in a dormitory between the ages of 18 and 22. And not once in five years did he see a fist fight. Could you imagine? 600 males in one room, in one dormitory, not once in five years, there's a fist fight? Could you imagine such a thing? So how does that happen? Because if you're learning Torah, it's affecting your neshama. If you're doing chesed, it's affecting your neshama. If you're sitting at the Pesach Seder and you're eating matzah, it affects your redemption neshama. It affects your redemption consciousness. Same thing with karpas, same thing with charosis. Charosis, I ever had charosis. And there's always somebody in the room, every time you mention charosis in the room, somebody in the room just goes, oh, I love charosis. <laughs> there's always somebody, uh, you know, we just think of charosis. And, and, and oh, charosis, and that's mortar. That's some pretty good tasting mortar over there. You know, I want you to put out some mortar because then your guests are going to leave. Nobody's going to want to be at the Seder. So we eat the charosas and it's if it's the mortar. Yeah, it is. It is. By eating charosas, what you're doing is you're tapping into what happened back then, what's ultimately going to happen. Number one, 
Number two, we go to Avadi Mayinu. And in Avadi Mayinu, sorry, sorry, Manishtana. Go to the Manishtana. One point on the Manishtana. You'll notice that there's a tremendous amount of, if you're following this inside, if you're following this inside, it's on, it's on page uh, 24. You don't, it's not necessary to follow inside. I'm, just, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not reading through anything. I'm just on the, 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 the headlines. Start with Manishtan, and the kids sing the Manishtan, and so on and so forth. There's a lot of discussion. Two for the two first questions, the last question, the whole, 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 whole discussion and all the commentaries about Manishtan. But ultimately, what's it really about? What's Manishtan really about? The answer is, what's the theme of the evening? What's the theme of the Pesach Seder supposed to be about? It's supposed to be about freedom, redemption. We're free from being slaves. I want to tell you something else. Anything that you see, like all other customs, people have joked about this. I'm convinced it's not a joke. Do you know that when they did Avodas Perach in Egypt, what was Avodas Perach? Does anybody know what the Avodas Perach was in Egypt? The back-breaking labor, what was it? One opinion is they were building these, whatever it was, the pyramids, and it was sinking into the ground. Interminable work with no point to it. Number two, Avodas Perach was role reversal. The men had to do the women's work, and the women had to do the men's work. Ladies, you know what it's like when your husbands are doing the women's work in the house. right? Yeah. A woman goes out for the evening and says to the husband, okay, you're going to stay home with the kids, but stay home with the baby. What's the first thing every husband says? What time is he going to sleep? Right? The first question I want to know, what time do the kids go to sleep? A woman doing man's labor, a woman's got to go start schlepping heavy bricks. Women are not suitable for that. Put a man in the house with the children, a man is not suitable for that. He loves them to pieces. But a man alone in the house with children could drive him absolutely batty. Could drive him mad. When my wife abandoned me to go off to the, to the, to the convalescent home after she gave birth, and she left me home with the kids. She traipsed off to go, to go relax for a few days and left me home with the kids. I'll tell you something. I, you know, I remember, I just remember the first time it happened, I think I was home with three or four kids, and it was like, you know, first it's, Daddy, I want something to eat. So you give them something to eat, you break up a fight, change a diaper, back to the eating, back another diaper, check the oven, run around, and that's the first seven minutes. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, what second? And you're looking at the clock over like, am I, am I meant to really survive this? And then it really hit me when a kid comes over, he comes walking around and says, Daddy, I'm hungry. I said, one second, one second, one second. I just fed you seven hours ago. You know, how often is this going to happen? You know, that's it. Get used to it, kid. You know, that's it for the next three days. And by the end of the third day after a steady diet, I, I listen, I, I am an expert. I, I don't want to brag, but I will. I am an expert at making corn patties in the microwave. You know, I can make corn patties in the microwave with my left hand or my right hand. And after a steady diet of brownies and corn patties for three days, even the kids are coming over. Daddy, what time? When's mommy coming home? <laughs> <laughs> My wife gave me final instructions. She said, listen, she said, uh, it, it, when it comes to you, it, it, shampooing and washing and soaping and cleaning and everything else, and I said to her, I listened politely and I smiled, and I just said to her, when you come back, I'm going to give you back, them back to you, happy and healthy, Bezras Hashem. But all those hygienic action verbs ending in I-N-G, they ain't happening. Right? <laughs> there's no shampooing and there's no bathing, there's nothing. Right? There's survival. Daddy, I can't find Daddy, I, Daddy, I can't find my clothes. Just wear your pajamas. No, the, the, the Rebbe won't notice. <laughs> Just go. He knows Daddy so. So so what happens is Avodos Perach is role reversal. Avodos Perach is role reversal in, in, in Mitzrayim. So when when a person's a slave, when a person's a slave, the 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 uh, uh, um, the difficulty the difficulty is that you're basically told what to do. The theme of the evening is that we are free. Start off with Manishtana. Manishtana sets the tone for the entire evening. Sets the tone for the entire evening. You know what it is? Slaves don't ask questions. First point of the evening. Manishtana. What are you asking questions for? Get to work. Do what you're told to do. Manishtana before anything else shows that we're free. We're free to analyze and discuss, which a slave doesn't normally do. And that's why I say when people make a joke that we sat down at the Seder and everybody's relieved. The pressure is off the wife. The chametz is out of the house. The husband feels I've been doing women's work for the last three, two weeks. I've been doing women's work, which I never do. And you get to the Seder, I'm convinced that Chazal had that in mind. That's why we're cleaning up so much. Now we sit down at the Seder, we say to ourselves, boy, now I know what it's like to leave Egypt. That's not an accident. You think that's an accident? You think that this time of year where there's so much involvement in the house, you think that's not an accident at all. Chazal had that in mind. 
And therefore, we sit down at the Seder, the first thing, Manishtana, oh, oh, that's my declaration of freedom. My declaration of freedom is the fact that I get to ask questions. Then we get to the four sons. And, uh, sorry, sorry, we get to Avadim Ayinu. What's the answer to the question? The answer to the question is Avadim Ayinu. We were slaves in Egypt, which are, obviously answers the question. Manishtana, 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 Manishtana. We were slaves in Egypt. That's the answer. Now you're, answering, you're asking questions, number one. Number two, the idea of Avadim Ayinu, um, two points. The first one is that we say in the Avadim Hayinu that we were slaves to Paro in Mitzrayim and Hashem took us out. Now, let's go for a moment to Matzah and Chometz. Chazal say, and we say it in the Haggadah, that had Hashem not taken us out of Mitzrayim, we would never have left. What is, what's the difference between Matzah and Chometz? What's the difference? There's 18 a very, minutes. 18 minutes. Is, uh, that's true. That's true. That's how you make Matzah. There's a fundamental difference. What's that? How much? 18? Right. So the answer is like this. I made a bracha before. The answer is that, um, one answer. We say in the Haggadah, and Hashem not taking us out, we'd still be in Mitzrayim. So uh, there was an incident. A guy in Australia was going from uh, Melbourne to Perth, and he had to carry a Sefer Torah. He had to transport a Sefer Torah from Melbourne to Perth. He gets to the airport, and he walks up to the counter, and he's holding the Sefer Torah. So the lady at the counter says to him, I'm sorry, sir, you're going to have to check that underneath. You can't take that on the plane. He says, I'm not letting this out of my hands. She says, listen, you cannot take that on the plane. The guy says, look, I'm not letting it out of my hands, and I'm going to carry it. She says, I'm like, I'm not going to fight with you. You go to the gate, and they're going to take it away from you at the gate. They're not going to let you board the plane with it. So he goes to the gate. And immediately the lady at the gate says to him, Sir, let me have that. You can't carry it on the plane. He says, I'm not take, letting this out of my hands. Start arguing. Finally, she says to him, Listen, get on the plane, but they're going to take it away from you. You know, they're not going to let you, you're not going to let, they're not going to let you fly with that thing. He gets on the plane. Immediately the stewardess can come over to him. Sir, give me that thing. He has to check it underneath. I'm not letting it out of it. They start arguing on the plane. Finally, the stewardess says, Listen, I'm not going to argue with you. I'm going to call the pilot. She calls the pilot. The pilot comes by, takes one look at the guy. He says, hey, a Sefer Torah. Give it to me. I'll put it in the cockpit with my tefillin up there. There's one from pilot in the Australian, in the Australian Airlines, and he was there. I think they might have made a minion in the cockpit, for all I know. You know why not? So, so he takes a Sefer Torah. Now, I want to ask you a question. What are the chances in advance of that happening? And how much did he have to do with the result? The answer is zero. The difference between matzah and chametz is, take a look at how you make chametz. How do you make bread? Take flour, take water, you mix it together, and you let it rise, put in the yeast, and you let it rise overnight. I've seen situations where my wife has made, my wife has made the challah dough, puts it in a bag, a big plastic bag, puts it in the refrigerator. By the time I get up Friday morning, the refrigerator door has been pushed open because the dough, no, I'm serious, the dough, has, the dough puffs up because of the white caught and it actually moves. I've said the other time she's left it on the kitchen table, and also in the middle of the night, you just hear boom. Because it, the weight shifts in the bag, and all of a sudden it just kind of, kind of moves off the table, and boom, it's on the floor. So the difference between when you take when you make challah, what you do is you take flour and water, you mix it together, put it in yeast, step back, and then the bread assists, it takes part in its own development. That's chametz. That's what we're trying to get rid of. Right. We're trying to rid ourselves of chametz for the seven days of Pesach, which represents seven decades of the average lifetime, life, lifespan. The average lifespan is 70 years. The average lifespan is 70 years. Women statistically live longer than men. Uh, men live about 73, 74. Women live to about 77, 78. That's the average. That's the average. We've also done studies that uh, married men live longer than single men. You know that. Married men live longer than single men, but that married men are more willing to sacrifice their lives. So the, the, uh, the uh, what do you call it, the, uh, the, they, they, uh, they, they, what do you call it, they have the, they have the, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the 70 years, 70 decades, the chametz represents, the chametz represents the evil inclination, ego, physical desire, we push that away for 70 years. Matzah, on the other hand, you take flour and water, you mix it together, flatten it, and put it right into the oven. What happens? It comes out baked. At no point does the matzah participate in its own development. Matzah symbolically is whatever happened to us in Egypt was a force from the outside. It had nothing to do with us. The bread represents you did some of it and I did some of it on my own because I puffed myself up. 
The matzah means something came in from the outside and had nothing to do with us. That's the Rebbe Shalom. That's why the matzah is the theme of the evening, and it's a reminder of Avadim Hayinu. Because Avadim Hayinu is we were slaves to Pardo, and then we say, HaKadosh Baruch Hu took us out, and if the Ilu Lo Hotziyanu, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, means if would not take it, our forefathers out, we would still be slaves to Pardo in Mitzrayim until this day. That means we had absolutely nothing to do with our leaving Egypt. If you take a, 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 a lion, if there's a lion, and there are 10 zebras around. The zebras run from the lion. They can't do anything to the lion. If you put a thousand zebras there, it doesn't help you. If you take a 10 sheep and there's a, lion, a wolf, the sheep are in trouble. You put a thousand sheep there, a thousand sheep will not get together and gang up on, on the, even when you watch these films of the Wild Kingdom, you think, come on guys, just turn around and gang up on it, but they won't. We were sheep in Egypt. Power was the wolf. Increasing our number, we were helpless, hopeless and helpless. That's what Chazal are telling us. And therefore, we would never gotten out of Egypt. That's the first step, stage of Navadi Minyam. But then at the end, Mitzvah Aleinu L'Saper B'Tziyas Mitzrayim V'chol HaMar B'Lesaper B'Tziyas Mitzrayim Reza Meshubach. Somebody who does a lot of talking about it, you're praiseworthy. Anybody under, I'm going to suggest why that is. You're praiseworthy if you speak a lot about Yitzhak Israel. Why? What makes you praiseworthy? What's so great? You spoke about Yitzhak Israel. Okay. What does that mean? If you speak a lot about Yitzhak Israel, you're praiseworthy. So, the best example I could give you is watch a couple of men discussing a. I, like, I still call it soccer, you call it football. Watch a couple of men discussing a soccer match after their team has won, especially if it was in the 90th minute. Watch the men talking, right? Does their talking look like the same enthusiasm as when you ask them to do the dishes? It's, of course, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they're just, oh, good dishes, my favorite dishes. Yeah, somehow I don't think so. <laughs> and, and watch two men discussing the soccer results, right, the football results, like, oh, yeah, or talking about money. Right? Watch two ladies talking about their latest discounts. Right? Lady, went, <laughs> la- lady went shopping. You know, uh, watch, a, watch them discuss. I just heard about this. This wife says to her husband, listen, you know, today I'm staying home and I'm going to relax. And I'm going to drink tea all day. I'm not doing anything in the house. The husband says, oh, well, that's a shame because I th- actually thought I'd give you the credit card and you should go shopping. She goes, well, I was just kidding. He says, so was I. <laughs> 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 so, so the, the, the what do you call it? the the uh, the 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 marvelous sapir time is not that we're telling ourselves. You know what? Try to talk about it a lot. That's the plain meaning. Try to talk about it a lot because it's a mitzvah to talk about. You say, talk, 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 which it is. But the Haggadah is telling you that if you talk about it a lot, it's an indication, not that it's a mitzvah. If you really tapped into it, and you really tapped into the significance of what it means, we're leaving Egypt, we left Egypt, we wouldn't be, we'd still be there. And you really get enthusiastic about that, and it just kind of gushes out spontaneously, that means you've really tapped in. Because when something wonderful or fantastic happens to a person, it just gushes out spontaneously. You can't control yourself. So if we really, if we had gotten out of prison right now, imagine we just had this year, Ror Hashem, uh, uh, t- uh, what's the name, Rabashkin got out of prison. Could you imagine him and his family discussing it? Could you imagine them? Do you think they had to sit down and make an effort? Let's see. Let me open up my diary, my journal, and tell you what happened in prison. They're gushing with enthusiasm. They're gushing with excitement. That means you really lived it. You really feel it. And therefore, for a person who gets to that point at the Seder, where you're talking about it and you're energized about it, that means it's an indication that there's something that happened to you. You feel that you've tapped in. And therefore, Harez HaMeshubach. Okay, the four sons, which we're going to talk about a little bit in the next in the next talk as well. But there's one point over here which is crucial in understanding what's really going on. Sit down at the Pesach Seder. If you look through the Haggadahs, you're going to notice that among the commentaries of the four sons, which son gets the most discussion? Got it. The Russia. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? The Russia is the one who gets the most attention here. The Chacham. Yeah, we all like the Chacham, Tam, Shein Yudesha, the Russia, the literature. I'm telling you, when you look in the books, on the Haggadah, jit, 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 jit. that's what happens. The discussion on the Russia is unbelievable. So the first question becomes, if he's such a Russia, what's he doing at the Pesach Seder? What's he doing there? Wait, you can't find something more fun to do? 
I mean, listen, you know, he's not interested in reading the Haggadah. He just wants to get to the food. You can do better than that. Go to a casino. They got food there, too. Go to a club. You can do much better being at a Pesach Seder, especially where your cousins are there. Yeah, you can do much better. So what is he doing at the Pesach Seder to begin with? Why is he even here? Why is he even here? So the answer is like this. By the way, I, 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 I forgot to mention earlier, I forgot to mention earlier, and, and, and so I, I'm just going back to it because it, it's important just to drive home the point. What we said earlier about all the things that we eat and affecting us and so on and so forth, do you remember there was a concept called subliminal advertising? Subliminal advertising, I remember in the United States, it became illegal because it was so powerful and potent. In the United States, you go to a movie, and as the movie frames are running past you, they slip in in one frame, they may slip in like a picture of a box of milk duds. And what happens is that a short time, well, people are starting to leave and walk out of the theater into the, into the what do you call it, the, uh, the lobby, and buy milk duds, or Coke, or popcorn, whatever they slip in. It's moving way too fast for you to even know that you saw it. You do not know that you saw it. If I'd ask you, did you see anything strange? You'd say, no, what are you talking about? Yet, it leaves such a powerful impression on the subconscious that the United States have made it illegal. They felt that the consumer is at a disadvantage, at an unfair disadvantage, because now they're, you're actually pushing him out into the lobby. That's what's happening when we, take, when we eat the macharosis, and we eat the matzah, and we eat the mar. What we're doing is we are making a connection back to what happened, because there's some sort of effect at our subconscious. That's what the Tells of Rosh says. There's some sort of effect on our neshama, what we call the subconscious. There's an effect on our neshama that's actually bringing us all the way back to the original miracle. Now, back to the Russia. Russia is sitting at the Pesach Seder. I want you to listen to what the Russia, ter- his terminology. Russia, Mahu Omer, Ma Voda What are you doing all this work for? And by the way, hate to ruin anybody's day, but the commentaries say that when a person starts grumbling about the pre Pesach cleanup, a person starts fetching about pre Pesach cleanup, you say, What do I got to do this for? Guess what? He's echoing the words of the Russia. Right? He's no different. What do I got to do this for? Okay, listen, you know, it's tough. When I was a kid growing up, I could do no right on Erev Pesach. You know, if I asked for food, why do I need to eat right now? I always had crumbs. Somehow, my mother, uh, she should live with me well, could see crumbs on me that my, the, the scientific microscopes can't, say, can't pick up. You know, you brush yourself off. I was all day brushing myself off. In the Coupe de Grasse was when I'd go into the, go into the shower room and start scrubbing tiles in the shower room. I, that was my job when I was 17. I had to wash down the tiles in the shower room. And every year was the same thing. Mom, nobody eats while they're taking a shower. And my father would yell, don't get smart, just do what your mother says. Because he was, he was in a bad mood because he was cleaning the other shower room. Right? Like, he wasn't happy either. <laughs> so none of us were happy. And, and, you know, and we're sitting there. To, so I told my wife years ago, I said, listen, I'll do whatever you want me to do. Like I do anything else you want me to do. Notice I'm a couple thousand miles away. <laughs> you know, I'll like, like anything else you want me to do. But first, only if we clarify why we're doing it. If you think that that needs to be done because it's a halacha, then, then forget about it. Forget about it. If you want me to do it because you want to clean the house while we're doing the house, okay. But if you think it's a halacha, if you're doing it as a concern for chametz, so we can save ourselves all a lot of work and aggravation because that's not a concern for comments. That's not a problem. You want me to do it because you feel you want to clean out the house? Okay, that's like you're asking me to do anything else. I'll be glad to do it or escape to England, as the case may be. So, <laughs> the, the, uh, by the way, I just spoke to my wife on the phone. She said to me, you know, this is wonderful. Could you just extend your trip for another week? Because uh, I, I, you know, my, my help in the house is minimal as it is. One year, usually I've, I've come to JLE quite a bit over the years, uh, right around Rosh Chodesh Nisan. <laughs> it's wonderful for Sean Bias. And, uh, and one, one year I actually was stuck at home. I didn't have a trip and I was sitting, I was helping, which means I was sitting on the couch making, making suggestions. And at a certain point my wife said to me, haven't you got anywhere in the world to go? And, and that day the phone rang from the JLE to come for Shuas, but it was too late for Pesach. <laughs> too bad there's no comments on Shuas. In any event, listen to what the Russia says. Russia Mahu Omer, she told me this morning on the phone, she brought out the oven cleaner. You know that oven cleaner thing? I, that smell drives me absolutely batty. That's the pre-Pesach smell. That's when my mood changes all the time. She says it's a good thing here in England. So the Russia Mahu Omer. Ma avodazos lachem. Lachem velolo. Meaning for him and not for you. Because he excluded himself from the community, it's as if he has uh, denied a fundamental of the faith. Now listen carefully. 
blunt his teeth, the emor lo. Listen carefully. Say to him, Hashem li Hashem did this for me when he took me out of Egypt. Li, listen carefully, li velo lo, for me and not for him. Ilu hayasham, had he been there, lo hayanigal, he would not have been redeemed. Well, it's, it's something strange here. Because the first time it says, it says, Af'ata, say to him, say to him, I'm addressing the Russia now, and then I say, for me and not for him. Had he been there, he wouldn't have gotten out of Egypt. So what have I done? I've shifted from first person into third person. So now God is telling you, when you address that Russia, you know what you do? You say to him, Hi! It's okay, it's okay, it's okay. They, it's, I love it when it's someone else's kid. <laughs> I just love it. Love it, love it, love it. <laughs> the, uh, the, the, what do you call it? The, 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 um, I turn to the Russia. I'm going to answer him. I'm going to turn to this Russia. I say, you know what? I'm going to answer you. Say, Shem did it for me, not him. Had he been there, he wouldn't have gotten out of Egypt. What just happened? The answer is, it's a rule in life. The fact that somebody says why doesn't mean they're asking a question. Very important rule. Somebody, I learned this the hard way, and all husbands have. When somebody says why, the wife says to her husband, I tell you, the first time it happened to me, I was, I was married for two years. Uh, no, sorry, I was married for two weeks. <laughs> two, two weeks or two months. So, so it was a wonderful two years, <laughs> just like two years. So I, I, I had grown up without sisters, and I was clueless. And I had gone out to a wedding one night. I think we were married maybe about a month. I went to a wedding, and I came home late. And my wife said to me, why didn't you call to tell me you're going to be late? So I said to her, well, I was actually looking for a public phone, and I couldn't find one by the time, you know, and then so I came home. She said to me, you have an answer for everything. <laughs> well, she asked me a question. I gave her an answer. She obviously was not happy with it. And here I was learning in Kolel, where all day long we asked questions and answers, and my chavrusa was always good with that. So I, I didn't really know what, what, what happened. A few, about a week later... She said to me, why didn't you take the garbage? I said, well, I was going to, but then you asked me to do the dishes. I, by the time I finished the dishes, I forgot to take the garbage. It said to me, you have an answer for everything. <laughs> I'm like, well, what went wrong over here? And again, I was clueless. I was absolutely clueless. And you should see the reaction when I say this over to I teach at the seminaries in Israel. I say this to the girls at the seminary. So you're talking about a room full of 100 girls. And I'll say to them, you know, and I said to my wife, uh, I was looking for a public phone. As soon as I start saying that, a hundred girls in unison start going, oh, no, 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 no. Because what was the correct response? Of course, I said, why didn't you call? What's the correct response? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm worse than the goat on Yom Kippur. You know, off the cliff I go. You know, the, you know I'm the bug on the chatan. That's, that's supposed to be the response. But what I learned when I read Men Are From Mars, I finally understood what had happened. And I realized, first of all, I understood, start apologizing. But I didn't understand what happened. I didn't understand what happened. So I realized she never asked me a question. She didn't ask me a question. That wasn't a question. Her husband comes home. Ladies, if you ever want to get your wife home, if your husband's home, by the way, start washing the kitchen floor. It's a school if her husband's going to come home. It works every time. My wife is washing the floor. I come into the house. You go, why did you walk across the floor? I just walked. Well, I had to get to the refrigerator, get an apple. <laughs> wrong, wrong, cut, cut, cut. The answer is, I'm sorry, I'm an inconsiderate. I say, explain to the guys when they get married. That wasn't a question. The fact that somebody said it in question form, it wasn't a question. It was a statement. The statement was, you are an inconsiderate boor. Right? That was a statement. Right? And the response, if somebody says that to you, especially your spouse, is to say, I apologize for being a boor. Right? Somebody once said, don't criticize your wife's, your wife, don't ever criticize your wife's choices because you were one of them. So, uh, so understand, understand that, that, you know, and I, so what happened here? I learned that it wasn't a question. It was a statement, not a question. This applies in many branches of life. Person attacks us religiously. Ah, why do you have to keep Shabbos? What's the correct response? What's the correct response? Correct response is no answer. Zero response. Because he wasn't asking a question. He's looking for a confrontation. I don't have energy for confrontations. Somebody says to me, I don't keep Shabbos. I am curious why you do keep Shabbos. You're curious, you deserve a response. You're respectful, I'll answer your question. But if 
I bet, I, I, I sense that Rabbi Stepsky is about to give me a signal of how much time is left. What is that? Six, 15 minutes? You put up one and a five. One hour more. Okay. <laughs> I actually did this. I did this. I'm speaking somewhere. I have a minute. I'm speaking in a yeshiva in America. And the principal, I'm, I'm speaking in a yeshiva. The, 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 the principal who's very, very kind of, kind of, kind of very straight. Uh, he's a principal. And I was speaking and he puts up his hands like this. He goes like that. So I made it. I said, what, five more hours? Right. So he comes walking all the way from the back and he comes right next to me and goes, five minutes, right? <laughs> He's used to talking to his students. So what happened was with the Russia is, the Russia did not ask a question here. The Russia is making a statement. When the Russia, please close that, close that door. When the Russia is making a statement, the Russia is saying, ma'avoda zosachem, that wasn't a question. He said it in question four. Normally, He's making a statement. I don't think much of what you people are doing. Now normally, how should we respond? How do we respond normally? Normally the response is, ignore him. Don't say anything. Why are we responding? We're responding because there are other people here. I'm responsible for everybody else at the table. Who knows? I don't know if they're going to be affected. And therefore, I speak not to him. I speak about him. I turn to everybody else and I say, had this guy been there, he wouldn't have gotten out of Egypt. Because I got two things that I have to do. Number one, I have to put him in his place. And there's very little in life that's as humiliating as being spoken about in third person. When he speaks and I don't even answer him, I turn to somebody else and I say, had he been there, he wouldn't have gotten out. So that's humiliating him. Plus, I'm telling everybody else and I'm taking care of everybody else, making sure everybody else understands that that wasn't a question. That was an attack of, on our fundamentals. We're not willing to tolerate that. I'm not going to dignify you with a response, but I want you to understand that he wouldn't have gotten out of Egypt. And therefore, the structure is that we're talking to everybody else. We'll explain a little bit more in the next, uh, in, in the next hour. We'll explain a little bit more about, about what that sun is, uh, if anybody's here. To be continued. To be continued. To be continued. To be continued. Yeah.